Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. From the Soviet Union, a special wildlife report. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Today I'm speaking to you from Moscow. It is fitting I should be here because in May of 1972, an historic agreement was signed between the United States government in Washington, D.C. and the government of the Soviet Union in the Kremlin just behind me. This agreement resulted in a broad scientific program providing for the exchange of experience technological ideas, and both cultural and scientific specialists. Wild Kingdom became the first wildlife film team ever to be invited to enter Russia to film the animals and wildlife preservation program of the Soviet Union. We have become, in this respect, part of the implementation of that broad environmental agreement. We're extremely pleased to be here to bring you this special report for we have long been aware that the Russians have been world leaders in many phases of wildlife conservation, including the preservation of certain species of animals from extinction. They saved these greatly endangered animals through development of wildlife preserves. The Soviet Union is huge, five times larger than the entire United States. Throughout the country, there are 105 wildlife preserves. There are also over 1,000 wilderness reserve areas, some as much as two and a half million acres each. Many are areas untouched by man, where wildlife is protected and studied. And in them are numerous mammals, which once were greatly endangered. In the northeastern USSR, Wrangel Island Reserve is one area of the Russian Arctic where the familiar polar bear is indigenous. Still an endangered animal throughout its range around the world, this animal is now fully protected under Soviet law and may no longer be killed. In the far southeastern portion of the Soviet Union, along the Sea of Japan, can be found the Siberian tiger, another endangered animal. It is native to the extensive Sikote Alin and Lazovsky preserves. To the west of there, in the Bargusin Mountains Preserve near Lake Baikal, is where the Russian sable can be found. Once, fewer than a hundred sables were left alive. Soviet scientists saved them, and now they number into the thousands. Found in the steppes of Kazakhstan, near the Caspian Sea, is another animal which teetered close to extinction, the saiga antelope, which was once slain in great numbers for its meat. Now, like other endangered species, it is protected and no longer facing extinction. Far in the south and west of the Soviet Union, in the mountains near Samarkand, lives the Siberian ibex. Still considered rare, it is gradually increasing its numbers through full protection. The largest concentrations are now found in the mountain preserves here. South of Moscow, some 300 miles, is the nearly 77,000 acre Voronich Preserve 
Here stands a 300-year-old cathedral of a former monastery, long a landmark. Voronich Preserve is typical of the type of preserve where the balance of nature has been restored after having been destroyed by man. The Soviets proudly call it an island of nature. This building is on the grounds of the Voronich Preserve headquarters, a relic of the past with a blanket of bright spring flowers at its feet. The peaceful Usman River flows serenely past the headquarters, weaving through fields of beautiful flowers. Not only lovely flowers grace the Voronich landscape, now there are trees again, and leaves rustle in light breezes, becoming the rebirth of a nearly forgotten symphony of nature. This is a lovely place in the summer. The foliage is deep and lush, and the calls of the birds from the surrounding forest are almost unceasing. But because of the density of the forest foliage, Summer is not the best time to see the Voronich Preserve wildlife. The time for that is the midst of winter when the woods fill up with snow and a different sort of beauty prevails. The winter landscape of Voronich Preserve has a clear, crisp beauty enhanced each time a new snowfall comes. The trees stand like dark, silent sentinels their feet wrapped in stark whiteness. There are more than just deer and other wildlife living in this vast forest, and more than just extensive stands of fine trees. Right in the midst of this 100 square mile island of nature is a little village of 200 people at the Voronich Preserve headquarters. 40 scientists are among this number, living dedicated lives here the year round with their own families. Their object is the preservation and protection of the woods and wildlife, the furtherance of biological research and education, and the relocation of the growing abundance of wildlife from here to areas elsewhere throughout the country where they are needed for repopulation. Here, as they work, their children thoroughly enjoy the snowy fun of winter, as children do in colder climes the world around. While the children play, their scientist parents are busy throughout the preserve with conservation work. In this Voronish Preserve cage, there are a couple of men important to Soviet conservation whom I'd like you to meet. This gentleman is Boris Kester, the present director of the Voronish Preserve. And with him is Dr. Krinitsky. For 10 years, he was at the Voronish Preserve, and he is now director of all 105 USSR nature reserves for the Soviet Ministry of Agriculture in Moscow. We are very glad that you have come here. Поедем вместе, посмотрим, мы увидим много интересного. Я думаю, что вы не будете об этом жалеть. Thank you very much. Welcome. Я очень рад, что вы приехали к нам. I have indeed enjoyed being here, and I'm sure I'll enjoy the remainder of my stay. Ну, мы должны идти, у нас еще есть много дела, поэтому не сердитесь, оставайтесь здесь, все хорошо. До свидания. До свидания. Доктор Кринецкий и мистер Кестер уезжают сейчас на небольшой тур в этой области. И когда мы следуем, мы увидим природу и зимнюю красоту этого великолепного русского пресерва. The area called Selection Plot is where experimental work is now being done on growing trees which are more productive. One of the economically important concepts of the experiment
plants, which Boris Kester wants Dr. Krenitsky to inspect, is a remarkable concept that has succeeded impressively. A Siberian pine tree branch is grafted to the top of a common pine. The Siberian pine, both Boris Kester and Dr. Krenitsky know, takes about 50 years to begin bearing cones. But grafting makes new growth develop high quality nut cones in about 10 years. These nut cones produce valuable medicinal compounds and lens polishing substances. Pine trees at Voronezh constitute a small part of the huge forest, but they're ideal habitat for Russian red-tufted squirrels. Their keen eyes miss little activity occurring within their territory. This squirrel has become nervous over sight of a red fox who has detected the scent of a mouse. Squirrels and foxes are abundant here now. In the past, they and other Voronich animals disappeared when their habitat was disturbed by man. Now, with their habitat restored, they have returned. Part of the winter conservation program at Voronich consists in protecting the trees by providing other food for the animals such as hay for the red deer. When these deer at Voronezh Preserve reproduce beyond normal population figures, the excess animals are captured and relocated to other areas. The red deer at Voronezh are very handsome animals, similar to the American elk, and not too much smaller. Larger specimens have been known to weigh over a quarter of a ton, and the conservationists here have established new red deer populations all over the country from the surplus at Voronezh. Often, travel by the scientists and their families is done in horse-drawn sleighs, a pleasant way to ride through a snowy forest. They're heading for the preserve headquarters now, where specific scientific projects are in progress. One of the Voronezh scientists, here at his vehicle, is presently preparing for a field project. As he and Dr. Krenitsky confer, Boris Kester continues his own duties as director. En route to his office, he encounters a familiar sight. The Voronezh villager who has made friends with the wild deer She's one of the women who assists in working with beavers, and she often carries some of the excess beaver food to the frozen surface of the Uzman River adjacent to the headquarters. Her familiar callings immediately attract every deer within hearing, for they've become accustomed to her daily treat for them. She's affectionately known as the Deer Woman. Early in the season, as she does this, the deer are very wary. But gradually, they lose their fear of her. Eventually, she is able to feed them right from the bucket. But today, they're nervous. The successful deer program at Voronezh Preserve allows at least 200 deer annually to be immobilized and translocated to other Soviet regions where they're scarce or non-existent. Fifteen hundred deer have been removed without loss of a single animal. Credit for that belongs to one of the Voronezh scientists, Dr. Vladil Komarov, who developed a revolutionary immobilizing method better than the hypodermic syringe dart. He hollows out the slug of a small bore bullet until the lead sides are very thin and grooved to prevent more than superficial penetration when it strikes an animal. The hollowed out bullet, loaded in the lab with a Karare derivative, acts on the animal's motor centers without otherwise affecting it. The slug is sealed with wax and coated to indicate drug dosage, when made and by whom. Today's project under Dr. Komarov 
will be the immobilization of one of the larger animals here, the Siberian moose, of which Voronich Preserve has a sizable population. It will not be a very long drive from the headquarters to where an assistant is waiting to help demonstrate the great value of the new Soviet process for immobilizing large animals. This is the area where the immobilization project really begins. And now a different form of transportation will be used. Mobile. Dr. Vladil Komarov is esteemed as one of the most skilled Soviet biologists. And with him is a young Voronich man who provides valuable assistance to him in the work being done in the immobilization projects and related research. Soviet scientists are well aware of the snowmobile's versatility in game management and research. During winter, they use it extensively in locating animals to be immobilized. Dr. Komarov's method permits perfect shooting from long range, as opposed to syringe darting, which requires close approach and frightens animals. The bullet strikes with only a faint sting, and the moose won't move far before dropping. The drug-filled bullet only barely penetrates the skin, so there's no danger of massive tissue damage to the animal. A glance at his watch tells Dr. Komarov that the waiting's over. Now they'll approach to begin the tests and marking. They must work quickly and efficiently, since the effectiveness of the drug lasts only half an hour. The sureness that comes from long experience, Dr. Komarov has timed their approach just right. The tests on this moose that the scientist will make now and the data he gathers may prove to be of greater benefit than if obtained from an animal immobilized in the usual way, the syringe dart shot from bow or air gun. Both respiration and heartbeat readings taken through Dr. Komarov's method probably come closer to normal readings and will therefore be more accurate. Checking the heartbeat Dr. Komarov finds it strong, and his helper prepares to mark the animal for long distance identification. Dr. Komarov always makes thorough notes, which include any unusual reactions of the animal, testing and marking is being accomplished. He collates this information with scientists here and in America. That serves a dual purpose. This and similar projects increases man's knowledge of the species and his ability to preserve it from extinction. Of equal or even greater importance, the scientific cooperation which is involved in these projects promotes greater understanding between the two nations. The ramifications are far-reaching. Other nations can learn much from the Soviet-American effort toward mutual understanding and cooperation. Now, some distance away, having continued his tour of inspection, Dr. Krenitsky is greeted by an old friend, Dr. Leonid Lavrov beaver master of the preserve. Dr. Lav and Dr. Krenitsky were close colleagues for many years, and probably no one has worked harder or accomplished more in saving the beaver from extinction in Russia than Dr. Lavrov. This large beaver lodge on the frozen marsh 
has been in constant use by the same family of beavers since 1939, generation after generation for 36 years. Neither man had expectations of actually seeing any beavers today, but now they're lucky. The warm day has encouraged a large brown beaver to venture outside. The brown beaver joins his mate, one of Russia's beautiful black beavers, and both to know that at last, the frigid season will soon end. The Soviet program of conservation moves the world a great stride forward in the preservation of endangered species. As we have seen, the Soviets are very cognizant of the importance of not only carefully relocating wildlife to increase their population, but also the need to establish new preserve areas and rebuild damaged habitat. In this first part of the special wildlife report from the Soviet Union, we've concentrated on the wintertime activities. Next week in part two, we'll see what happens here at the Voronezh Preserve in spring and summer. The program of international cooperation between Russia and the United States sets a good example for other nations. Increased conservation cooperation between all nations cannot help but be of benefit to people the world over, to animals throughout the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom.